if you don't have an assistant, you are one. <laughs> Somebody said that to me the other day, and I was like, oh my gosh. You see, I am the king of all delegators. I, I know some of you aren't. I know some of you have a hard time delegating, and we could do a whole, uh, a whole meeting on that someday uh, about how to delegate and why to delegate and some methodologies on all of that. But I am a great delegator. Why am I a great delegator? Because I am lazy. There are so many things I hate to do. I just don't want to do them. And if you don't want to do something, then you delegate it. That's the first law of being in business is get rid of that task. Well, the second reason I'm a great delegator is I think I'm worth money. I think that after all the education experience I've done in my lifetime, I should be paid a certain wage. Let's for fun, let's call it hundred dollars an hour. I think I'm, that's $200,000 a year. So I think I'm worth that. I don't know whether I am or not, but I think I am. So if I've got a task that is worth less than $100 an hour, then I need to delegate it. I need to give it away to somebody who might be making 10 or 20 or $30 an hour. Uh, and then I'm making money on having given that task to somebody as long as there's something to do with my time uh, that's worth $100 an hour. Or if it gives me more time for vacation and uh, that's part of the reason for this show. So this is Randy Kirk. You found Small Business Daily. And today we're going to be talking about gig workers, we're, but not domestic gig workers. We're going to be talking about primarily offshore gig workers through a product called Fiverr. There's Upworks. There's other ones. But I'm going to just talk to you a little bit about the methods I use because I use them a lot. Okay. So to begin with, um, some of us think this is a great idea to hire American, to hire American folks. And I do too. I'm a rock rib, you know, America first guy. And I believe that we, we need to hire American talent. But the reality is right now, as I'm talking to you, the beginning of April, uh, 2021, employment is going to be full. We're going to be talking about it. so hard to find people, so hard to get good people because we're going to be at a full economy and it's just going to be rip roaring. And the number one complaint that I get from my consulting clients, as well as the number one issue that comes up in our mastermind groups is where am I going to get great employees? How am I going to hold on to great employees? So one of my solutions is to find those employees offshore. Uh, some huge advantages to offshore employees. The biggest one being that you don't have any of the overhead costs associated with normal employees. You're not housing them. You're not providing them with equipment. Uh, you're not paying their social security, half their social security. You're not paying half of their Medicare. You're not, there's no unemployment tax. There's no rules and regulations that you're having to fill out forms for. So your, your work, your overseas workers, massive benefits when it comes to these kinds of issues. The second major benefit is that they're commonly making way less per hour for the same job than a domestic worker would make. And uh, for instance, I, I get a lot of my uh, workers in the Philippines, in Pakistan, in India, and in some of the Eastern European bloc countries, uh, Serbia, et cetera. And those folks in those countries uh, are, if they can make four, five, six dollars an hour, uh, they're really happy. Uh, not only are they happy, but they would, in the Philippines, uh, six or seven dollars an hour puts you in the top third of the income uh, in the Philippines. So um, you're helping out somebody in these countries in a way that it, it's indescribable in terms of the benefits they're getting from em being employed by you. And at the same time, you're going to be way more competitive uh, in the marketplace, if you're paying uh, $6 with no overhead and somebody else is paying $15 or $20 with tons of overhead uh, for the same or even sometimes a better worker um, in the offshore situation. So, but how do you find these people? And I got I to tell you, this is actually something that I deal with. Um, and it's maybe one of the reasons why I wasn't using as many people as I should have been a couple of weeks ago 
And then somebody said that to me. They said, if you don't have an assistant, you are one. And I'm sitting here going, well, I have lots of assistants. I have five people in the Philippines that are working for me. I have another uh, two in Pakistan, two in Serbia, one in Brazil. I'm, I, I almost forget all the countries now that I have these people working for me. But I realized that I was still doing stuff that I didn't want to do stuff I hated to do and stuff that I wasn't necessarily that great at doing. And so I, as soon as I heard that, it was like, boom, I need more of these gig workers. So I jumped back over on Fiverr. And by the way, if you, if you want to hook up with Fiverr, there's a link right back, right down in the, uh, in the description there. You can just click on that. It'll take you right to Fiverr. And you'll also help the station because we do have a, an affiliate relationship with them. So if you, if you go to Fiverr, how do you then find the right person? How do you find somebody who's going to work out for you? Well, let me start with one idea. And that idea is you're probably going to, the first time you use them, you're probably going to pay them between five and $50. Okay. So if it's complete bust, it's been more a waste of your time than it has been of money. So don't worry, just kind of relax. It's okay that you have to try three times to find the right worker and you'll spend five, 10, 50, hundred dollars testing three workers before the third one maybe, or the second one, or maybe it's even the fourth one. So it costs you $120 to find the right worker. How much does it cost you to find a, a great worker here uh, domestically? Well, it costs you a lot more than that. So, so relax about what it's going to cost you. You may have to try several and you might want to try them all at once. So maybe you have a specific job, a task that you need done and you send it to three different gig workers and you pay all three of them 30 bucks each or whatever, 120, 110 and one, whatever it is. And then you see each one, what the job is that they did and you can make a decision on future work. Oh, this person did by far the best job. And in fact, it's quite good quality and I'll use them in the future. So that's number one, it's kind of relax, okay? Number two, and maybe this is obvious, but I just gotta say it. I gotta, gotta make it clear that I don't buy anybody that hasn't got any previous experience. <laughs> and so right on Fiverr, it'll tell you, it'll say how many gigs they've done. And I typically am looking for somebody that's done hundreds. Uh, sometimes I'll find a category, I'll find a gig, a specific work, a specific job, that there isn't a lot of folks out there that are competing for it. And I might have to hire somebody that's only done eight or 10 or 12, uh, uh, you know, people they've only had experience with 10 or 12 folks. Generally speaking, I can find people that have got hundreds of pieces of experience. Then I can go in and I can look at that experience. I can look at the responses, the things that people are saying about that particular worker, and that'll help me to make my decision. So I'm looking for lots and lots of experience. On Fiverr and other similar setups, it's very unusual for people to judge them harshly in terms of the reviews. So you're going to be looking for people that have five stars, 4.9, 4.8. Somebody only has four stars or three and a half stars. They've probably done some bad stuff. They've probably really messed some stuff up because there's a tendency and I've read about this in other forums, there's a tendency for people to give five stars. And I see it myself, uh, where I wouldn't necessarily give five stars for something on Amazon or something on Yelp. I'm quickly giving five stars to most of my uh, gig workers from Fiverr. So, so you're going to be looking for folks that have a lot of experience, and you'll be looking for people that have five, 4.9, 4.8 ratings uh, as, your, as your primary go-tos. That's, that's where you're going to want to start. The next thing is like anything else in life, you're going to want a clear job description. And you might want to do this even before you go on Fiverr and start looking. So you're going to want to write it up. What is it that you're trying to accomplish? How, when do you need it accomplished? What are the steps to accomplishing it? What needs to be done to get to where you need to go? Just like you were going to hire somebody to come in and do it. Uh, in your facility. So get that job description as clear as possible. Then you can go on and start looking for the specifics of what it is that you're trying to do. Now, there's key words. So uh, in this case, the people you're trying to hire 
are using the key words in identifying what they do. And it now it becomes your job to figure out what they're calling themselves. How does the task that you need doing get described? And so that might take some time. You may need to fiddle around, try some things, scroll way down. Don't stop at the top, scroll, scroll, scroll. When you're doing research, I don't care what kind of research you're doing, you're also gonna, always gonna benefit from scrolling down and going to page two and page three. This is a, a rule on uh, when you're doing research on Google or Amazon or on uh, Yelp or any place else that you're looking for suppliers or looking for help to, to help you with cer certain jobs, go to page two, scroll, go to page three. Because what's going to happen is you're going to start to see the words maybe that this is this gig worker is much more specific about what it is that you have in mind, or it gives you an idea for another keyword. Now you can look up that keyword and you can find a bunch of workers, whereas maybe the keyword you were using, there was not very many that were specific to the task. So this is another part of what you want to do is, is use those keywords. Find out what the keywords are that, that are specific to what you're trying to do. So now you've gone in, you're finding some folks that are uh, at the right price. You're finding some people that have a lot of stars. You're finding people that have done a lot of gigs. You're looking at the reviews and you're happy with the reviews. Now let's look at what they're specifically offering. And typically there's gonna be some kind of a write-up and it's gonna say, this is what I'm offering. You review that and see if it makes sense. And almost always, they're going to give you three levels. You're going to click on the on their uh, specifics, and they're going to say, "Okay, this is level one that costs five dollars. Here's level two that costs twenty six dollars, and here's level three that costs a hundred dollars. And here's what you're going to get in all these different levels." The interesting thing I find, this is completely the opposite of what you'd expect, is that you're going to pay less per per item for the entry level than you are for the step ups. So if you're looking for five posts on, uh, on Facebook um, and the those five posts are $5 each, but now you want 10, they're gonna be $55 <laughs> or $60 for the 10. I don't know why this happens the way that it happens, but it must be something about the psychology of the people looking on Fiverr are the psychology of the people selling their services that they feel like they need the entry one to be super cheap. And then you know, all of a sudden you want to buy more of that. You, you, you would think you're going to get a discount, but no, you're actually going to pay more for more. That may or may not matter in your case. You may be like, fine, I really like their work. Or here's the other thing about Fiverr. Everything is negotiable. Okay. Pretend you're in Tijuana. <laughs> Everything is negotiable. So don't take the price. Um, they will create a custom gig for you, if you like. It doesn't even have to be one of the three things that they're showing, if they're showing three. You can say, oh, no, I don't want 10. I want 17. So, and, and at 17, I think my price ought to be $5 each, not $6 each. What do you think about that? I have almost, I would say 100% of the time that I have offered a lower price because I thought that their price was a little too high. When I've offered the, the, the lower price, they've almost always taken it. It's rare, rare, rare uh, that, that the gig worker says no to your, to your negotiation. So negotiate your price. Okay, now the next step is the communication. Okay, don't hesitate to over communicate. As you're communicating, pay attention to how they're communicating back. One of the fastest ways that you're going to be unhappy with this work, with this gig worker, is going to be the fact that they just don't have that crate of language skills or communication skills. And so if they don't, and you feel like this is going to be a barrier to getting what it is that you want from the job, then call it off. Go on to the next one. There's usually dozens of people that can do your, the work that you need done. So, and, and again, if it's not on Fiverr, you may want to go to Upworks or some of the other ones that are out there. So, so check that part out, okay? How are they communicating with you before you push the button to pay them? How is that communication going? And then once you do pay them and you start the work, 
over communicate again. If you want the job done right, communicate clearly what it is that you want with instructions, detailed instructions. Don't try to go halfway, really do a good job of communicating. So now you've hired the person, you've communicated with them, and now they're going to deliver the work. When they deliver the work, don't hesitate to say, no, that isn't what I was talking about. Generally speaking, they're not going to say the work is complete until you've seen enough of it to know that it's right. But sometimes they might say, hey, the job's complete. And then you look at it and you're like, oh, this isn't complete. Now, it's true that a lot of these gig workers, even after you've paid them, will still make the fix. They'll still do the, the job that should have been done the first time if there's something wrong with it. But why take the chance? So it's better before you pay the final payment, you transfer or say that the job is complete because you pay in advance, okay? I don't, I don't know if you knew that, but you'll, you pay Fiverr or Upworks or whoever, you pay in advance. And then when the job is finished, the money sits with them, they hold onto the dough. And then when the job is over and you say that the job is complete and you're happy with it, then they transfer the money. So it's always better to make sure everything about the job is finished to your, to your satisfaction before you then go, okay, yes, I've received the job, it's complete, I'm happy. And then of course you're gonna fill out and you're going to, uh, they're gonna give you a form where you're going to rate the worker. Um, remember again, people overrate. So if you're gonna give somebody a four, it could hurt them, okay? If you're gonna give them a three, it could hurt them. So it should have been a really bad job. And if it's a really bad job, why, do you, why not have them go back and fix it rather than give them a low score? because it could really hurt their income. So I tend to give fives, like 100% of the time I give fives unless there's something really a mess. And quite frankly, that has never happened. Every single gig worker I've used, it has turned out to be fine and I've given the five. And then when it talks about how do they communicate, and they ask you several other questions, I generally give, give fives on all of those as well. Now it'll ask for a description. Um, I try to give as much information as I can that would help them to get a job if I think they've done a good job. So you fill all that out. And then the next thing they're going to do is say, hey, do you want to tip the worker? Now, if I have beat them up on the price and I'm never going to use them again because I, it really was a one-time thing, I'm going to tip them. You know, I'm just going to do it. It's, you know, it's part of the deal. But if I'm going to use them on a continuous basis, I'm not tipping. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm not trying to be uh, cold-blooded, but if they become a standard worker and I'm giving them work every week or every month, then I'm not going to tip them. Um, I'm also not going to tip them if I didn't like the job and, and was unhappy with the work. And if it's an expensive job and it's a one-out, let's say it's 100 bucks or 120 bucks, and it's a one-out and I didn't negotiate, I paid full price, I might not tip then either. And I, and I tend to be a tipper. I was a waiter uh, for many years. And so I tend to be a tipper. But if it's an expensive job and I didn't negotiate it, um, sometimes I'm not going to tip then. So anyway, those are just my, my methodologies. It doesn't have to be your methodology, but those are just some of the, some of the things that I do. Um, so that is how you find really good workers for really low prices, how you set it up, how you create Future opportunities, again, remember, if you like the work they did and now you want lots more of it, don't take their high price on the, on the, on the much more of it. <laughs> Negotiate the price. Um, take care of your people and they will take care of you. It really is an outstanding way to get a lot of work done at a very low price compared to your competition. So this is Randy Kirk at Small Business Daily, and we'll see you tomorrow.